Welcome to SpyCast, the official podcast of the International Spy Museum. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Hammond, the museum's historian and curator. Every week, we explore some aspect of the past, present, or future of intelligence and espionage. Please consider leaving us a five-star review so that other listeners can find us and subscribe to the show if you haven't already. Coming up next on SpyCast. I specialised in, uh, in a way, international terrorism. And that is why mm. uh, in 92 and 93, I led the Indian intelligence teams for our annual dialogue with uh, USA. This week is our fourth instalment of our five-week special on spy chiefs around the world. This week's guest is Vapala Balakandran. Vapala was a talented policeman who rose to become the Deputy Commissioner of Bombay, present-day Mumbai, but the story doesn't stop there. He was talent-spotted and went on to work for India's foreign intelligence agency, the Research and Analysis Wing, a.k.a. RAW, rising to become the Special Secretary, which is the number two position at that agency. He was later appointed a member of the High-Level Committee to look into the police response to the 2008 Mumbai terror attacks. He's an active columnist in Indian newspapers and is the author of several books, including his most recent, Intelligence Over Centuries, which looks at intelligence from pre-biblical times all the way up to the current war in Ukraine. In this episode, Vapala and I discuss India's research and analysis wing, the Tamil Tiger's threat to Indian national security, intelligence considerations within India-Pakistan relations, and lessons in intelligence from ancient India. The original podcast on intelligence since 2006, We Are Spycast. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Well, thanks ever so much for taking the time to speak to us. Um, I just wondered if you could tell us, Bala, where are you just now, sir? I I am in uh, Mumbai, uh, Maharashtra. I originally uh, hailed from Kerala, uh, which is the southwestern state of uh, India. And but for my education, I went to a neighboring state called Madras, and that's where I studied. And then I became a member of the federal services. Now. Now, what happens is that you have to appear for a federal, federally conducted examination of all over India. And then, uh, depending upon the marks that you get, you are selected, but you will not get your uh, home state. Now, that was a deliberate measure that was done for the in national integration. As you know, we have a number of languages. We have various tribes, we have, it's a huge country. So the founding fathers at that time felt that the an officer who is selected for the these services should serve in outside state. That's how I came to be allotted to Maharashtra state. And uh, so mm-hmm. I'm here from 1960 onwards. I joined as a police officer of the Indian Police Service. And just to set the scene for our listeners, this is on the west coast of India, yeah. um, the the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea. Um, there's a strong maritime influence, uh, and the the state that you're in at the moment in Kerala, they are yeah. both very developed states, um, very literate states. Yeah, uh, you see, Kerala uh, has had uh, an ancient history. You know, it is popularly known as a spy state. It is a, a oh, the really? Romans were attracted, the Arabs were attracted, and the Romans were attracted uh, with the spice. There was an ancient port called Musuris. It is there in the uh, Roman uh, chronicles. And the ships used to come regularly uh, be, uh, the before Christ era because the multilingual or rather multi-religious composition of the population is also partly because of that. And... Uh, the the Christianity came in 52, Christ era. Thomas the Apostle came to Kerala. And then in 5th century, Christ era, Islam arrived as, through trading. 
and the 10th century uh, Christ era, the Jew Jews also came. There was a flourishing Jewish uh, enclave in Kerala. So that briefly wow. is the state. Just briefly, I mean, I find Kerala interesting for all sorts of reasons. Yeah. Um, as I understand it, it's a matrilineal culture. It's um, got the highest level of literacy in India. It's um, just a really, a really, really fascinating state for some of the reasons you just mentioned. It's had lots of different people flow through over the centuries. Yeah. Um, the literacy rate is very high, the highest in India, 94%. And... Uh, Wow. Uh, the Hindus are 55 percent. The Islam is 27 percent. Christians are 19 percent. So you will not find this uh, this uh, uh, sort of uh, mixture in any other state uh, in India. So that is something very unique about Kerala uh, that it has been open to the foreign influence, uh, mostly peaceful. There has been no war. Uh, no, nobody came as an invading uh, power to Kerala. And I, I love the food from there. I've tried some of the cuisine from there. Uh, hopefully I will get to visit in person one day. So you're this young man who grows up in uh, Kerala, yeah. go for the civil service exams, yeah. you move state, and then tell us about how you end yeah, up yeah. as you. a police officer. Yeah. Uh, I, I worked 17 years in Maharashtra. And even from the British days, the intelligence was mostly police-dominated depending upon the record of performance of a, an officer, he's, or he or she is picked up by the federal government. And that's how I joined the newly constituted foreign intelligence organization called RAW, Research and Analysis Wing, or the Cabinet Secretariat. This is something like what happened in USA also. Uh, if you remember, OSS also started as a research and analysis division. At that time, it was attached mm -hmm. to the Library of Cong Congress. So here in this case, this was attached to the Cabinet Secretariat. And uh, it was a, uh, you know, it was a nothing but foreign intelligence, but it was deputed there. And that's how I worked throughout there. And then I retired uh, in 1995 at the rank of a special secretary. Secretary is the head. Special secretaries are not the head, but uh, they are the Number two, you can call it number two. So that's how I Okay. Do. Wow. And just very briefly, so Maharashtra, that's also where Mumbai is, and that's going to be part of the story later on in, in our conversation. Yeah. So so when you're in the police, is it what people think of when they think of police work? Is it investigating, arresting people? Yeah. Or, or were you involved in more of the intelligence stuff, or, or does that come later? What happens in the police is uh, you work in rural areas. That is called the districts. And then uh, depending upon uh, how you perform, you are brought to the big cities. You know, so I, I came to uh, Bombay City in 1972. Till then I was in the district. I was superintendent of police of a district. And uh, then there, what you do is the crime and, and uh, law and order and uh, various other, uh, you know, attending to the natural calamities and all that. But uh, once mm -hmm. you come to city, you start ge getting into the uh, urban police system. M M Bombay police is something like the London Metropolitan Police. And there is a very old special branch which deals with the intelligence. Now, this intelligence, li exactly like in uh, uh, London, the special branch has got certain extra uh, commitments uh, for a national level. And uh, so I was in charge of that for about two, two and a half years. And uh, that's how uh, my work could be noticed by the federal authorities, and then they wanted me to join them. But I didn't have any, uh, any, any uh, you know, foreign intelligence uh, responsibility, but it was a higher, higher level of intelligence that I was doing in Bombay. For example, the protection of the VIPs, very important persons, including the president and prime minister coming. That is my personal job, collecting a, a foreign intelligence of foreigners operating in Bombay was my job. So something like that. But then when I went to uh, RAW, it was uh, something totally different. I mean, it's not like any 
law and order intelligence, it is something totally different. That's how I landed up in uh, Raw in 1976. I worked in Delhi and did uh, various other responsibilities and then uh, retired in 1995. Is it true that for the research and analysis wing, you know, the head of MI6 is yeah, called yeah. C and in the James, you know, in the James Bond movies uh, is M. Is it true that the head of the research and analysis wing is called R? Yeah. In the British days, uh, also, the something like this was there, but there was no foreign intelligence at all. It was the Intelligence Bureau, which uh, came in 1887. Yeah. And uh, so... They, they were doing all of the, the entire, uh, the external as well as the internal. But w in those days, in the British days, the entire foreign intelligence was uh, collected by the then MI6, and then they used to coordinate with the Intelligence Bureau. But after the independence in 1947, we did not have any such facility. So that is why the research and analysis was, uh, was born. There was need for a specialized uh, organization uh, independently to collect the foreign intelligence. And that is how 1968 Research and Analysis Wing was formed, or the Cabinet Secretary was formed. Otherwise, there is no particular reason why this particular uh, uh, name was uh, given. It's quite interesting to me, the symbol for the research and analysis wing, the lion capital of Ashoka, which I think is really, really fascinating. It's four lions yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, facing in every direction. Yeah. No, we have no, we are no symbol that we, for a long time, we, we were totally anonymous in the sense that there was not even a uh, mention in the, uh, in the reports or other official reports about the existence of research and analysis wing. And for about at least, even when 1971 war uh, took place between India and Pakistan, where uh, RAW plays a very important role, the, the, there was no official mention that RAW was doing this, etc., etc. So this came much later. This came much later, mm. I think in the, sometimes in 1990s, when they started mentioning about the organization called RAW. Uh, I do not know mm -hmm. how far that was correct, but I do not know. We, we followed the British tradition of being uh, a deniability that. So, so you go there in 1976. So tell us, what, what's your first job when you get there? What is it you're doing? Uh, well, I was uh, doing the analysis work, uh, uh, you know, because I was new to the, uh, I was new to the organization. So I was mm -hmm. studying in the what they call the area studies. We have various desks, mm -hmm. uh, China, Pakistan. Then there, there is always international terrorism. And uh, I specialized in, uh, in a way, international terrorism. And that is why mm -hmm. uh, in 92 and 93, I led the Indian intelligence teams for our annual dialogue with the uh, USA, with the US agencies. This was, that was set up because they, by that time the international terrorism had assumed uh, considerable uh, importance and it was felt bo both by the British government and by the US government that we should have periodical meetings with India because we, we were the ma major sufferer, I mean apart from some European countries like France, etc., etc. So that is how, yeah, yeah, that, that is my mm. specialization. So you go to the research and analysis wing, and you're you're an analyst. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That that is okay. what that is what I did uh, for about two, 10, 10, 15 years. I specialized in that, but as a senior officer, as special secretary, I was supervising other departments also. So for for those first fifteen years, when you were a counter terrorist. Yeah. Uh, specialist, where were some of the main places that you looked at? Was it, um, was it all over the world? Was it, was it in the region? Was it Pakistan, Bangladesh, no, we, uh, uh, other yeah, countries? We had, we had a, a, a serious uh, uh, threat from the uh, a, a Tamil force called LTT, Liberation Tigers of the Tamil Elam. That was from Sri Lanka. 
that is a major threat for us for a long time in fact uh, our former prime minister rajiv gandhi was murdered assassinated by ltt so that was a major thing it was not only pakistan but uh, also uh, the we have a a problem of northeast terrorist uh, terrorist units also we have a, a northeast you know several states are there and there are a number of ethnic communities are there and uh, they are also affected by the cross border terrorism is not only pakistan uh, ter- terrorism whether we suffer from traditionally uh, this this particular ltt was a major threat to india and uh, by way of uh, sabotage by way of uh, disturbances in the south india so it was a uh, it was a combined uh, almost like uh, the northern western and southern borders the sea borders also we we were worried about them mm and the the tamil tigers did they also have um some presence in the very southern part of india or was it yeah, only in yeah, sri lanka yeah, yeah. they had uh, see very important presence in the south india and they used to uh, you know it's very easy to cross over from uh, the across the, uh, the 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 very narrow sea between sri lanka and the tip of uh, india so it's very easy for them to take even an ordinary boat and land somewhere where there is no surveillance so they could they were infiltrating then what happened was that in 1982 or 83 there was a wholesale massacre of tamils by simhalas and there mm-hmm. uh, uh, because of that a number of refugees thousands of refugees came out to south india so these ltt people used to take the cover of refugees and come and uh, set up camps in different areas in tamil nadu which is madras state old madras state and they they turned out to be a very big problem for us and that was a you know ultimately uh, about 10 years ago the ltt was completely smashed with the help of india by the then sri lankan government and since then it is it is not there but then in between they created havoc for our as i mentioned a former prime minister was killed when he was doing the Uh, political canvassing uh, election canvassing mm-hmm. and uh, so that was a very serious uh, uh, threat that we were getting south from south india and from the northeast it was a chinese help in those days with certain ethnic groups like nagas and bangladesh also was cooperating with pakistan and se- sending certain islamic terrorists to india from the east and from the west of course we used to get cross border terrorism in kashmir so it was a it was a major threat for our existence and uh, mm-hmm. as 2611 terrorist attack revealed in mumbai in 2008 mm. and we'll come on to speak about that uh, in a little bit um just for our listeners and my, my memory is a little rusty here but what can you just explain to our listeners why the tamil tigers were a threat to india um as i recall uh, the tamils are uh, a, a group that was traditionally persecuted in sri lanka and they wanted to create an independent tamil yeah, state yeah. in the north part of of the island of sri lanka so why did they kill the indian prime minister why was it yeah, why yeah. was that a threat yeah. to india it, uh, it all started in there was a what they call a language issue that is how it started the when the british were there in sri lanka the tamils were the uh, the favorite uh, uh, sort of community uh, as you know sinhalas are the uh, original people they are the and then the, the tamils went there in two ways one was in the old days when there was an empire in in uh, south india uh, a part of uh, that uh, empire also covered the northern tip of sri lanka so there is some old settlers tamils who were staying there then the british took thousands of tamils to the southern part of sri lanka uh, to work in the plantations and uh, so they they were very loyal and they were english speaking and uh, the british uh, liked them and they patronized them 
And uh, so at that time, the, the language formula was uh, that you will have English, official language, and uh, then uh, Sinhala and Tamil. Then suddenly what happened is that after the independence in Sri Lanka, the Sinhalas completely cut out these Tamils. They, they started uh, discriminating against them. And because they were the British uh, government's favorite people, so it started like that. And one thing or the other led, uh, led the uh, denotifying Tamils uh, and uh, not at recruiting Tamils from the government. So 1982-83, there was a big massacre of Tamils in Colombo. So that led to uh, waves of uh, refugees coming. So the, the Tamil government in South India, that is Madras state, it is now Tamil Nadu. They impressed upon our Prime Minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, that we have to do something to help them. So all the refugees were accommodated in Tamil Nadu. A thousands of them were there in various camps. And then they started negotiations. And finally, so many things happened. And uh, what, what really happened was the, uh, there was a government, a Prime Minister called Jayavardhane, uh, a Singhala Prime Minister. He said, look, we can't tackle the Tamil Tigers uh, because they are very, very violent people. And uh, you have to send your troops in the army when the, and they s stayed there helping uh, Jayavardhane in tackling the Tamil Tigers. So that turned the LTT against India, saying that, look, why do you, you came to help us? And now you are turning against, you are helping Jayavardhane. So then one thing or the other misunderstanding started and uh, we had to, our troops had to uh, help uh, the Sri, Sri Lankan government and uh, then they became, the uh, the Indian troops became their enemies. So the one thing led to the other, various misunderstandings. Okay. And in 1992 elections, there was a possibility of Rajiv Gandhi coming back to power through the elections. So the, the, they th felt that if Rajiv Gandhi comes back, he will not help the Tamil Tigers, although he may help the Tamils in general. So that is the reason why they hatched up a conspiracy and killed him when he was addressing a gathering in Tamil Nadu in a place called Sri Parambattu. So it's a very convoluted story. And it's because of the leader, a man called Prabhagaran, his paranoia, Actually, Rajiv Gandhi had no such intention. He wanted to help them, but Tigers will not play ball. So that is why they became, they were isolated. Ultimately, the Sri Lankan government waged a war against them. They were annihilated. And now that particular threat is not there. It is uh, from Sri Lanka, we have no, no threat right now. India has no such threat uh, because of these armed elements uh, who were absolutely desperados. They were very, very violent people, and otherwise there was no reason for them to kill Rajiv Gandhi. Mm. And that that conflict came to an end in 2009 when the, the Tamil Tigers were defeated yeah. and, and peace came to Sri Lanka. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember as well reading the, um, just very briefly before we get back to your work with Raw, um, but I'm assuming that you looked at this, the... Tamil Tigers, they actually were the originators and the perfectors of suicide yeah, bombing. Yeah. It's, oft, it's often thought that this yeah. was, it's a religious practice, but the Tamil Tigers, it, it didn't have anything to do with religion, but they're the people that, that kind of perfected it in, in the right, modern sense. Right. Is that, yeah. is that yeah, correct? Yeah, that's right. You see, the suicide cyanide bombing, each uh, volunteer of uh, uh, LTTE will carry a small capsule of cyanide. Because if they are caught for interrogation, they will consume the cyanide and then die. So that 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 culture was star started by LTT, and uh, that went on. A number of uh, uh, people committed suicide like that, and they even they they used to have boys brigade. Young children were uh, abducted from the families. You know, the majority of the people didn't. Majority of the Tamils in uh, Sri Lanka didn't want. See, LTT to do this type of atrocities, you know. And they used to go and, uh, in the beginning, they were uh, quite friendly with the uh, Muslims, but they started raiding and massacring the Muslims. So all sort of, uh, uh, because of his, this man's paranoia, 
and he suspected his own uh, uh, associates and killed them. So it was it was like a, almost like a demon. He became finally something like a demon, and he had the uh, the baby mm. brigades, and uh, they were, they used to be sent. They used to go and ram uh, an explosive uh, laden uh, boats. They will go and ram against a battleship, and then another boat will take a video, and then circulate see, saying that this is how you have to do it. Something like worse than what Osama bin Laden was doing. Something like that. One thing that Bala and I spoke about, but that didn't make the cut, was an interesting twist of fate. That is, that the current leaders of the United Kingdom, Ireland and Scotland all descend from the Indian subcontinent, at least in part. Rishi Sunak is the current Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and formerly the Chancellor of the Exchequer the second most important role in the British system. His parents are of Indian Punjabi descent. Leo Varadkar is the current Taoiseach of the Republic of Ireland and was the deputy to a previous Taoiseach. His father was born in Bombay, present-day Mumbai, while his mother is from the southeast coast of Ireland. He is also Ireland's first openly gay head of government. Humza Yusuf is the current First Minister of Scotland assuming office in March 2023 after winning a leadership contest upon the resignation of his predecessor. He was born into a Pakistani Muslim family, his father coming to Scotland from Punjab, Pakistan, barely speaking a word of English to work in a sewing machine factory. His mother was born in Kenya to a South Asian family. I always find it interesting to ask people like yourself, how did you deal with all of the pressure? There's lots of things going on and there's lots of things that you have to bear in mind. So just on a personal level, how did you deal with all of that pressure? Was, uh, there was a lot of pressure. There was a lot of pressure, especially, for example, uh, uh, certain incidents happening, what will be the repercussions on India? Now, for example, anything that happens in Pakistan, uh, it has some repercussion in India. And uh, same thing, Afghanistan, uh, then all the neighboring countries, we have to watch them. It, you see, there's what is called third country operations, and uh, many of them. And then in between, what happened was that in the uh, 1980s, the Pakistani clandestine uh, bomb uh, making was started. That was, an, again, a, a priority for us uh, to find out exactly. And they were doing a totally clandestine route. And uh, so that was another uh, problem for us. So then what happens that the even the sometimes threats come from the other, as I mentioned, for a long time, uh, a, an unfriendly regime was there in, the, in Bangladesh. So Pakistan and Bangladesh intelligence services used to cooperate. It's not there now. The Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has uh, put a stop to all that. And as long as... She was there, we, we had no problem. But when she was not there, we had a serious problem. And then another thing is that we have to uh, inform the government prior hand if, uh, we, if there is any incidents which are happening. Even the political uh, realm, the, the, the prime minister would like to be briefed about uh, something surprising happening, even in non-intelligence sectors, for example, Politically, supposing something happens, that also is our. It is a, it is actually a multifaceted uh, role uh, of the uh, external intelligence. So it is not just mm. uh, uh, like, for example, there is economic intelligence. That is another thing, and uh, we had a fairly big military division also. Of course, the military intelligence mm. was separately collecting, but we also used to uh, help them, help uh, the government independently, not not uh, along with the military, mm. but we had no control over the military. They used to do their own work, but we used to do it in addition. Mm. So these are all mm. various things, and as you rightly said, it was a lot of tension. There was a lot of tension. It is a tension means the work pressure, which was there. And if there is a VIP visit, then again, uh, the security, we are not really in charge of the, uh, the Prime Minister's security or the President's security, but 
if there is any threat coming from the foreign country it was our responsibility just as it was our headache to uh, to uh, see whether there any uh, threat to the visiting vips as i mentioned i had to make a mm. special trip all the way uh, to south africa to get a briefing what are the threat because they they suspected that there could be an attack on mandela uh, in uh, when he comes to india so i had to go there and uh, get a briefing and take precautions we have no uh, role to play within india but we have to brief our counterparts that is the vip security cell and the intelligence bureau so th- this coordination mm. uh, between the foreign and uh, domestic that also is a big uh, responsibility one thing that i was going to ask was can you just tell us a little bit i think that a lot of our audience will be quite fascinated to hear a little bit more about your time on the high level committee so this is set up in 2008 um to investigate the mumbai attacks and um, maybe you can tell just refresh our listeners memories what were the mumbai attacks yeah. and what were you doing when you were a member of the high level committee yeah. mumbai attack took place in uh, in november 26 on that 26 it went on till 29th actually it happened on 26 night that is why it's called 26 11 and uh, it went on till 29th i was not in india i was actually in usa attending a stimson center conference so my friends in the state department asked me uh, uh, to give a an idea about who would have done that uh, media people also asked me so i gave a preliminary uh, preliminary assessment that it could be uh, lashkar taiba and uh, then i returned to india after my visit and uh, the maharashtra government what happened was that uh, since the attack took place 10 terrorists came from by the sea route from uh, karachi and uh, and then they played havoc with uh, uh, mumbai 10 terrorists are holding the city to ransom and uh, 45000 policemen were not able to uh, you know to, to save the the city from the uh, the the dis- destruction done by these tent terrorists so there was a, a very big uh, political uh, storm in the maharashtra assembly legislative assembly so the chief minister announced that we were going to inquire into this and so he appointed a two member committee the chairman uh, was a former governor who was also a senior civil servant and the number two was me because i had the police experience of having worked in mumbai or rather in those days that it was called bombay uh, bombay police and i had also the intelligence experience so i was the number two number, uh, number two means the second member but practically mm-hmm. the whole report was written by me now what i found was that is where i uh, we found that you know osi uh, open source intelligence uh, was not studied properly because there were any number of from 2006 onwards there were intelligence reports coming uh, from this central government that pakistan is tra- training a special squad of marine terrorists that means this time they would use the sea route to come to india so then from 2006 onwards there were any number of uh, ter- uh, intelligence alerts coming from the government of india now some of them must have been even given by outside uh, by maybe friendly intelligence services also but then the intelligence reports were there but what happened was that the no action was taken by maharashtra government by uh, you know intensifying the sea patrolling or extra vigilance of the sea coast with the effect that these tent terrorists came without uh, without any opposition they came uh, through a, a boat and then they stopped uh, the their boat uh, a distance away and then they got into a rubber dinghy which they had bought and then they divided themselves into 
five groups and uh, they started their uh, attack. One group went to, uh, there is a hotel called Trident. Trident uh, is also Oberoi. They started operating there. A second one went to a restaurant called Leopold Restaurant, killed about 17 people there. Then from there, they m went to Taj Palace, which is uh, one of the very famous hotels in India. They they were there till the about 29th. Third group went to the very busy railway station. Yeah, that railway station, any time you can get about 2,000 people waiting for the trains. And there they killed the maximum number of people. And the same people went to uh, uh, another hospital where they killed some people. And it was, it was really mayhem. There was no way in which they were uh, resisted by the police because the these 10 commandos were had uh, AK-47, they had grenades, they had, uh, uh, you know, satellite phone, they had uh, cell phones, and they had grenades, as I mentioned, they had grenades, and they were very well-trained commandos. So for about two, three, so two, three days, the city was completely devastated. And uh, so in our inquiry, we found that there, there was no sea patrolling, there was no intelligence uh, assessment, open source intelligence. Just in September only, there was a major attack by the Taliban uh, to the Pakistan hotel. And uh, uh, what was significant was, there were, after the threat by the government of India that uh, seaborne attacks will come, there was a TV channel, television channel, popular television channel. They uh, took a recce of the sea coast because we have a number of vital installations on the sea, like the Baba Atomic Energy Department, our port, uh, Bombay port is there, then the seafront hotels are there. So was there any improvement in security? And the TV channel said that there was no perceptible police uh, in, uh, presence at all. Still, the Maharashtra government did not do anything. That means that they completely neglected the secret intelligence which came. About 16 intelligence reports were there and open source intelligence. So that is why I'm telling that when I keep on saying that OSI gives valuable pointers and then you have to work on that. That is, uh, you mm. know, that, that is a lesson from 2611. And uh, only one terrorist was caught alive. And, and they, had, they had done such deception. They had identity cards in Hindu names. And they were speaking, they were specially trained in the special Hindi that is spoken in Bombay. And so they were well trained in, the, in case they are caught and shot dead. They will all say that they were Hindus. They were not uh, Muslims at all. So it is a perfectly well trained uh, you know, team which set off alarm in the, even in USA. I remember to have read in USA Today that this, this particular uh, attack, the USA at that time felt that a similar attack will come on seacoast uh, installations in USA because the Department of Homeland Security had, uh, uh, had uh, uh, you know, formalized a, a protection plan. So that, there was a panic not only in India, but also in USA. And I just want to go back in time. <laughs> Your recent book, uh, you look at intelligence over the centuries around yeah. the world. Uh, and in the beginning, you outlined that one of the reasons that you wrote it was that other books of, of, of a similar kind, they overlook the contribution of... of uh, intelligence practices in, in ancient yeah. India. Um, so I was just wondering if you could tell our listeners a little bit more about that. This could this could easily be a whole entire podcast in and of itself, and it would be a really fascinating one. I'm sure most people have heard of Sun Tzu. So just tell us a little bit more about the Indian tradition of intelligence uh, back in the yeah. past. Uh, you know, uh, we had, in, even ancient India had uh, a tradition of having intelligence right from, uh, you know, we call the pre-biblical era as a Vedic age. 
that is you know vedas were the holy text that the aryans who who came to india and uh, so even the vedic text there used to be uh, mention about the spice you know there were these various the aryans it is reported that they came from either iran or from central asia and uh, they had employed i mean uh, this vedic ages 1500 to 1200 before christ era and they they had uh, the, the vedic texts say that they were employing spasas is actually spice they to find out what the other tribes are doing and gradually you know the tribes came and then they expanded the territory and then uh, finally uh, the uh, when the greeks came to india alexander came to india that was around 350 290 before christ era there was a, a, a kingdom called magadha which is the most uh, you know prosperous and very powerful uh, country i mean uh, an, uh, an empire and the the emperor was chandragupta maurya and uh, he had his advisor called chanakya he was also called kautilya he had two names one is chanakya and kautilya and chanakya uh, he he wrote a book called artha shastra artha shastra actually it only means the 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 science of uh, ruling or rather the administrative rule so he had written this in 15 different books and the period of uh, kautilya or he is also called chanakya was 4 to 3rd century bc uh, that is before christ mm-hmm. era and he had written 15 books and this was all almost forgotten but at the same uh, at the same time uh, other historians have said that in the magadha the the they were uh, used as you know the spices were used for example uh, bill duran in his uh, the legendary author of the 11 volume story of civilization has given a case study of chandragupta maurya who as a ruler of magadha had unified most of india under one rule now he says that maurya chandragupta maurya divided his daily schedule into 16 periods each of 90 minutes is something very interesting and he said that during the eighth period i quote he again met his council council of ministers and heard the reports of his spies including the courtesans whom he used for this purpose the good english translation had come in 1915 in a princely state called mysore mysore was a maharaja so his one of the historians translated from sanskrit and wrote a, a very good uh, uh, english book in 1915 but again our historians uh, did not uh, know much about it now in uh, the the description of spies are scattered in 15 different books spies are meant to collect domestic and foreign intelligence for various requirements for internal stability for detecting traitors and for war and for subverting the earlier rule in rule in captured territories by causing turbulence and stabilizing the invaders sovereign regime he had laid down also instructions on deception and covert operations now it's quite possible that the the western world did not uh, know anything about it except through the writings of max weber or german american political scientist hans morgenthau they but they didn't lay much emphasis on on the uh, the the spying part alan dallas mentioned in his book the craft of intelligence uh, about sun tzu who also uh, you know operated around the same age 4 400 bc but he did not mention uh, chanakya at all so even in india the the, the surprising aspect is the intelligence bureau also did not know much about chanakya's it is not that chanakya's book was 
taught in our uh, spy schools or anything like that. In fact, we did not. We we mostly uh, were teaching the uh, the Westerners, like the British authors and the, the American authors. So there was a total mm -hmm. uh, ignorance about this uh, the con contribution of Chanakya. Now it is quite possible, as the foreign authors have said, that many of the kings in those days have followed his uh, instructions how to organize a spy service and also how to employ the spies, etc. Now, there was another most important uh, 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 person is uh, uh, called Thiruvalluvar. He is from the south. His name is, uh, uh, you know, he, uh, nobody knows really speaking when he lived, but it is assumed that he lived in South India in the first century BCE or second century Christ era. Now, the, this he wrote a masterly uh, book called Thirukural. Kural means holy uh, couplets, you know. And that particular book had 133 chapters. And they were, it is in a poetic form. He was a poet. Basically, he was a poet. He was also supposed to be a sage. And uh, he was giving instruction to the various kingdoms in South India. This, uh, you know, those days, 1330 kurals. Kurals are couplets. And 481 to 590, he has mentioned how intelligence is to be obtained. And 589, mm -hmm. especially 590, is, the, is what we call the trade craft. Even now, uh, you know, we follow certain things, like, for example, the need to know restrictive security, how, what uh, deception, what disguise the spy should adopt, all those things are there. And then another thing is that uh, the king should not believe if one spy gives the information and he should be, uh, uh, you know, uh, verified through another spy. This I call uh, intelligence adjudication. This, this particular thing, I, I started calling it as intelligence adjudication. So that this is actually to filling the gaps to make the picture, uh, you know, complete. Mm. And is this the first podcast that you have done on your book, Bala? This is my first trip. So we are also the first podcast ever to distribute this knowledge? <laughs> yeah. You're, you're, wel you're welcome, history. As a first caller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very kind of you. Yeah, you're, kind of you're, you're yeah. welcome. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think that the Arthur Zastra is really fascinating. This is lost for centuries, as I understand it, and then it's only rediscovered a um, hundred and sort of 40 years ago or something. Um, and I, the, I mean, it's really, really fascinating when you go through it. It even talks about things like triangulating knowledge or corroborating information. Yeah. If you get information from three sources, then you can trust it, which is, you know, what, what uh, analysts look, look for these days. To help you digest the episode, here is a brief snippet on the Sino-Indian War of 1962 between India and China that Bala mentions. Like many modern wars, this was a border dispute. Essentially, where does India end and China begin? We are talking about a 2100-mile border featuring snow caps, rivers and lakes at the roof of the world. Yes, the Himalayas are part of the story, and sometimes the line of actual control, a notional demarcation line, is at a height higher than any mountain in the entire Western Hemisphere. Border patrols often bump into one another in the remote region, and both sides are competing to build infrastructure along the border, which in turn can lead to clashes that are sometimes fatal. On October 20th, 1962, Mao Zedong ordered the People's Liberation Army to attack, and a war was fought over the border, which India lost. If you think about the date, at this point, the United States was locked in the Cuban Missile Crisis with the Soviet Union. You may ask, is it a coincidence? <laughs> Not really. The Indians went on to ask the Kennedy administration for air support, which would lead to the deployment of the aircraft carrier USS Kitty Hawk. But China announced a unilateral ceasefire, withdrawing from much, but not all, of the invaded territory. 
The result was the withdrawal of the USS Kitty Hawk, sweeping changes in the Indian military, and the underlying issue which remains a live one to this day. I know that you're retired now, but you still have your eye on the on the spy game on intelligence because it's your past and you've just written this book on it. So I just wonder if you could just tell our listeners a little bit more about your book. So there's always a, a problem of uh, uh, the economic resources uh, and uh, that is the reason. But so that type of fight is going on, which is still not under co- control. So that is one. The second one is uh, we have, of course, a uh, major problem with the China, Chinese. You see, because uh, after 1962 war, uh, this is now the time when uh, our relationship with China is, uh, is quite uh, uncertain. And uh, so we have had uh, border clashes in 2020 in which uh, some of our Indian soldiers are uh, killed. And uh, the, the, uh, the problem with China is there was a CIA estimate in 1960 when the Chinese were clashing with the then Soviet Union that the CIA had very rightly mentioned that China will rake up the border problem when the political relationship is strained. At that time, uh, Khrushchev and... Uh, Mao, Mao Zedong, were having their own fights. So over that, the uh, the border clashes took place. And this particular assessment is still valid even uh, with us. Our uh, uh, political relations with uh, China are strained because India is a member of the Quad, the the four, uh, uh, you know, grouping. That is Australia, uh, Japan, India and, and uh, uh, America. So because of that, there is a suspicion that we are ganging up with United States in the the South China Seas also, Indian Ocean also. This is the major uh, threat that we may have because they have the uh, you know a, a large uh, border with us. We had in uh, border in Xinjiang. Uh, there is a place called Aksachin, which they are claiming as the, and uh, then there is a middle sector, uh, the uh, you know where again we are facing China near Bhutan, and then the northeast in Arunachal Pradesh. There is a place in the northeast called Arunachal Pradesh, and there there they say that that is there. Whenever an Indian uh, VIP goes there, they lodge a protest, and. So uh, this is going on. The, 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 the intelligence is connected with this type of threats which are coming. It is, I'm not saying that there will be a war or anything like that, but then border skirmishes are likely to happen. They will come. Our border is not demarcated at all. And uh, due to uncertain nature and also the length of the... We have, we have 2,100 miles of border with with China. To demarcate that, they have one interpretation, we have another interpretation. Whatever it is, the the problem is, we have a a, a double front, uh, you know, threat that is from Pakistan. And Pakistan, we don't know what will happen. And Pakistan and China relations are good. And China, uh, by itself, they are, uh, even in international forum also, we are uh, uh, we are sort of facing hostility, more so because of the Quad. So that is the uh, that is the big problem I think in, we are facing, and uh, then this can happen in various other ways like cyber uh, attack on us, as uh, they've been doing with U.S. Uh, vital concerns. You know, Pentagon has been attacked by them, so similar thing can happen here also. I don't want to be speculative in my assessment, but these are the major threats that I can flag as an outsider. I am I am now a student. 
I'm, I'm no longer a, mm. an intelligence operative. I have no access to any uh, any secret intelligence. I have only uh, media. So I had based my assessment only on that. These two I, I have to flag. Mm. Wow. And I think that it's, it's really fascinating because India recently overtook China as the world's most populous country. And I, I think that also the fact that India is a democracy is quite interesting because if countries that don't buy into democracy can undermine Indian democracy, then th that's quite an interesting statement on the world stage. So it sounds like there's lots of challenges there. So people that work for the research and analysis wing, they're not going to close up. They're not going to close the business anytime no, soon. No, 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 no. We can't afford. We 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 can't. <laughs> we can't afford to relax. <laughs> we cannot afford to relax. Yeah. It is a. It's a. It's a. You know, the more uh, uh, the economic uh, uh, re reasons also are the. If they, because now it is commonly known that India is a very good investment destination. Uh, many foreign mm -hmm. countries are coming. Taiwanese uh, uh, corporations are coming. Uh, Western American companies are coming. So there will also be a uh, an economic, uh, uh, you know, if they sabotage some of our economic progress, that also will be a. A pro proper, I mean, a, a, a danger to India. So we have to be very watchful on various fronts: military, border, economic, cyber, and uh, uh, also with that tie, tie up with uh, with the uh, neighboring countries. They are having extending uh, their uh, cooperation with uh, Nepal. They are having very warm relations with uh, Pakistan. Uh, I believe they are. Uh, now having a very warm relation with Afghanistan also uh, to get into their natural resources. So all these things are, uh, we have to sort of, you know, we have to be very careful about that in, in days to come. Mm. Wow. Well, thanks ever so much for your time. This has been a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate you sharing your story and your expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of SpyCast. Please follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up on next week's show. So I was very conscious being the first. Um, not that I had to do it better um, than my male counterparts, um, but to be as inclusive as I could be, to make those opportunities available to other women, to, to just sh to, to be present and be, be very available across the community. If you have feedback, you can reach us by email at spycast.spymuseum.org or on Twitter at INTL Spycast. If you go to our page at thecyberwire.com slash podcast slash spycast, you can find links to further resources, detailed show notes, and full transcripts. I'm your host, Andrew Hammond. And my podcast content partner is Aaron Dietrich. The rest of the team involved in the show is Mike Mincy, Memphis Von III, Emily Coletta, Afu Anokwa, Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Jen Iben, and Emily Renz. This show is brought to you from the home of the world's preeminent collection of intelligence and espionage-related artefacts, the International Spy Museum. Spy.